right, back on the KNC Masterpiece with NBA insider Zach Lowe. Zach, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Hope you guys are doing well. Well, we're doing good. The The Mavericks are off to kind of an inconsistent start. At times, they look like a team that played in the Western Conference Finals last year, and at other times, they look like a team that could struggle to make the play in. What are your thoughts so far on watching the Mavs? I think you just about summed it up, and I don't think that's surprising. When you have Luka Doncic, there are going to be a lot of nights where you look like you can make the Conference Finals again. He's that good. He's a one-man scheme destroyer. Any scheme you throw at him, he can figure out. And they are, I think, slightly better than their record, which is 9-7 and seven right now. Uh, on the other hand, you know, when Jalen Brunson left, their second-best ball handler, shot creator, left. They, they didn't replace him with a perimeter shot creator, and so there are lots of nights, as you guys know, where it feels like it's the Luka show and they don't, they don't have a plan B, and that's just going to get exacerbated by – this Jason Kidd, Christian Wood thing because he's the second or third best shot creator on the team, and clearly the coaches don't trust him to play big minutes right now. Zach, did they clearly read the Brunson situation wrong with that? Were they really too cavalier believing that ah, he's just going to sign back, that we have no issues here? I don't think they misread it at that time. I think they knew by then that he was a major flight risk. If they didn't, I mean, we knew he was, so that they did they did something wrong. But I think they did. I think when they misread it is waiting too long to offer that four year fifty five million dollar extension, which was the most the most they could offer them. And there was a there was a universe and a time where he would have happily taken that, and they didn't offer it then. And by the time they offered it, he had clearly outplayed that contract, and it was too late. Um, and I do think it's fair to say they misplayed their hand with him in that sense. Zach, as we watch it, and you, you mentioned this just earlier, that you feel like that this team is a little bit better than what their record is. Can you identify the struggles against teams that are without their stars on the other end? I mean, they, they, the Mavs have been losing these games, and it seems like that you know, you know it, others are out for their opponents, and, and they can't do anything with that. It's like they don't like any prosperity for their for their team this year. Yeah, I think one or two of those are on back-to-backs. And look, I, I get that as we, as fans sort of obsess over every game, and that's what fans do, that's what they should do. Like the Pistons beat the Nuggets in Denver last night without Cade Cunningham. Just Just weird stuff happens over the course of an NBA season. Now, if we get... 45 games into the season and there are three or four more losses like this and it's like well does this team care do, are they going to bring it every night i think it's it's fair to start having a, a longer discussion about it but i i the regular season is such a grind i don't read too too much into like two or three individual losses like that nba insider zach Lowe joining us right now zach you mentioned christian wood and the jason kidd situation I know it's only 16 games into the season, but how do you see playing this out, that he finds his role on the Mavs or the Mavs are trying to move him before the trade deadline? I would say it's more likely the former just because I, I don't <clears throat> I don't know what kind of value he's going to have in the last year of a, a contract, although he is extension eligible, um, you know, midway through the season and to what team he's going to hold that value. So I think both sides have – incentives to sort of figure it out and figure out what his role should be, how much he should play, how much he should play as the only big man on the floor and just sort of let it fly and see how good these offense are, these lineups are offensively and how whether they can survive defensively. I think it's more likely the former. And then the Mavs got destroyed last year in the playoffs on rebounds. So they went out and got JaVale McGee to start and probably play about 15 minutes, the role that he had probably with the Lakers and Jason Kidd as an assistant coach. And really soon into the season, he pretty much lost his spot in the rotation. Very successful in Golden State, in L.A., last year in Phoenix. Why why is he not successful in Dallas at all? Well, that's why I chuckled the other night when Jason Kidd said, you know, we have a lot of big men. Like there are just some nights where, you know, the minutes aren't going to be there for Christian. I'm like, all right, let's see what big men you have. Maxi Kleba might be the best of all of them other than Christian Wood. He's injured. Um, Dwight Powell and JaVale McGee have both been out of the rotation for portions of the season. So it's not like you have that many big men right now that are standing in Christian Wood's way of glorious playing time. But look, JaVale is JaVale. He's going to be a rim protector and a rim runner. And I, 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 he hasn't been great. I'm surprised how quickly he got sort of yanked out of the rotation. And, you know, he got reinserted the other night 
um, and played okay. I, 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 the way these things go, I mean, you've seen it with Dwight Powell. He's out of the rotation until he's not. I, I think JaVale will get more chances and look better in those chances. But to me, the ride-or-die big man combination with this group is Kleba and Wood. And that group has been very good together when, when Luke has been on the floor too. Zach, when you, when you look at Jason Kidd as a coach, is his style – the way that he manages his team conducive to how coaches need to be in the NBA? Or do you have to be more of a friend to these players and kind of manage the season, as you mentioned? I mean, I think it just, that just depends on the players, the personalities on the team. Obviously, in Milwaukee, his style kind of wore thin, both, both schematically on the court and the way he interacts with some players off of it and in practice. I think, by all accounts, he's kind of learned from that. And softened a little bit, but he's always going to be Jason Kidd, man. He's prickly. He's tough. He wants to win. He was a genius player. He has super high expectations. He was a tough, physical, nasty player. He has super high expectations for that. And, you know, again, we're 16 games into the season, nine and seven. I, I didn't hear a lot of Mavericks fans complaining about Jason Kidd's coaching like four months ago when they were in the conference finals or whatever it was six months ago. So, Zach, when it comes to the West right now, and you talked about Denver obviously you know, losing a few games and, and stuff like that, who do you really like in the Western Conference right now? I thought the top three in terms of when we get to the end, who do I trust as potential championship contenders, teams that can realistically win three series in the Western Conference? I thought it was clearly in whatever order you want, Golden State, Clippers, Nuggets. And arguably all three of those teams, for various reasons, have sort of disappointed out of the gates here. And Phoenix has sort of emphatically said, yeah, we got injuries. we got a guy who's not on our team anymore, doesn't want to be here. We're still pretty damn good. Utah has started to fade a bit. Portland started to fade a bit. I think when it all comes out in the wash, those three are still going to be the best three teams to me. But Golden State and the Clippers in particular have a lot to prove in terms of getting healthy in L.A. and finding their identity as a team. And just sort of Golden State getting Clay to continue rolling and just sort of figuring it out the bench and all that. But I, I still think those three in the end have the best shot at, at emerging as that top three. What about a team, you know, Zach, we, we see what Sacramento's done. It looks like Mike Brown has kind of pulled that thing to really nicely together for them, at least to start the season. And then also with the Pelicans, can you handicap, you know, how you see those two teams maybe making a run at, at, at kind of keeping things uh, going for them. Yeah, the three teams that I didn't mention there um, that have enormous upside, short-term, long-term, are New Orleans. Just, I mean, the talent is the talent, and they're loaded with picks, including the Lakers pick coming up. They can do whatever they want in terms of trade. Memphis, <clears throat> who just keeps on winning, injuries be damned. They have a lot of stuff to make a trade. And Sacramento... You know, I was high on Sacramento before the season. I wasn't this high. I don't think anybody was this high. Yeah. They have the best offense in the NBA. It's it's crazy how good they are. Now, they're still a bottom five or six defensive team, and if that is just who they are defensively, and I think they might be a little better than that, but still, I don't think they're a threat to, like, win the West. But certainly they've made the race for the top six a, a lot more interesting. Well, back to the Mavs in this scenario in the Western Conference, Zach. You, you have so much knowledge. What do you see the Mavs possibly being able to do to do to improve this team to maybe get into the conversation of a championship contender? I don't know that that happens this year. Um, you know, Tim McMahon and I—he was on my podcast last week. We joked about how they're they're the, that Dallas's team holding pattern, and I, I do think they're still searching for that second guy that is the ideal complement to Luca. They've done a great job kind of cobbling role players together around Luca, although a lot of those guys aren't shooting and playing well as they were as well as they were last year. I still think they want to search for what's the real co star here. And as long as they have that pick hanging out to the Knicks, it's hard for them to go out and get that guy. Uh, it's hard for them to really compete on the trade market with some other teams who are searching for that same kind of player. So I think you know, they'll certainly look for little incremental upgrades here and there. I think in terms of big stuff, this is going to be more or less the team. They always surprise you, so you never know, but I would bet on this being basically the team. Zach, if you talk about the perfect second guy to go with Luka, because Luka is on the ball so much, 
Who would be a guy that you think would be a really nice second guy for the Dallas Mavericks? I get to pick anyone in the NBA, or do well, I, I know realistic? maybe like Greek freak. I, I I get, but like I'm just wondering, like maybe the type of player because uh, I feel like Luca has to get rid of the ball more, and the ball has to touch other people's hands. I think even Jason Kidd has kind of talked about the usage rate just being insane right now. I'm just wondering, is it like a a Brown for for Boston? Is it like what type of complimentary player would Dallas maybe be realistic in being able to get in the future? Well, I don't think they're going to get Jalen Brown right, out of Boston, that. but right. that but that is a, a wing who defends and shoots three shoots threes and can take some of the ball handling load. I mean, every team is trying to get that player. Um, kind of peak Paul George, I think yeah. somebody like that would be a, an, an ideal name. I'd also be interested in kind of going the other way and like, is there? A, a big man who's just an A plus defensive player, and maybe a right now a B plus A minus offensive player who moves the ball, but he doesn't hold the ball. So, like, if you could find someone like Bam out of Bio or what Evan Mobley is becoming, somebody more like that that you know, okay, if this guy's on the floor, we had a chance at having a top five defense, and he's a decent to very good offensive player who moves the ball, so he's not going to really take it too much away from Luca, but. You know, we're talking about players who are hard to find, obviously. Yeah, yeah Zach, and, and uh, well, how if you if you're identifying these players, and I, I think you did an excellent job there of, of describing the type of guy they need. If you're the Mavs, how far along? Again, we're really a little bit into the season. How long do you take to identify that? Hey, we absolutely have to go. Is it going to be all the way up to the trade deadline, or is that something they need to identify quicker? Oh, that that's, I mean, every organization is already having those conversations every single day. They've got a whiteboard somewhere of names or a document somewhere of names that they like and player types that they like. You know, it's just, as I said before, sort of a matter of when and with what assets and who are we competing with for players X, Y, and Z. Um, and it's it's more of that to me than, than them sort of, I think they know probably what they would like to accomplish it's just how and when man zach we really appreciate your time and all the insight and hopefully we'll get to talk to you a little bit later in the season and have a happy thanksgiving yeah i may be headed down there i'll, I'll let you know if i if awesome. i get down to dallas but happy thanksgiving to you guys too it's a shame you have to work with mcmahon like you do <laughs> and uh, you've got your place uh in, in, in heaven for having to do that for sure <laughs> Oh, uh, Tim's the best. You guys know that. Like cranky and cranky and curmudgeonly, just like me. We're like two peas in a pod. All right. Well, you guys do a hell of a job. Thanks again, and happy holidays to you, sir. Thanks, guys.